You are tuned to another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I am your host, Jack Johnson. Well, today's show is going to be completely dedicated to the trade deadline and the moves the Royals made right at the buzzer. That includes Ryan Yarbrough. That includes Scott Barlow. And we're going to talk a little bit about the roster moves that could be ahead. So lots to get into with the little Royals roster shakeup. And that's going to be coming up next on Locked On Royals. You are Locked On Royals. Your daily Kansas City Royals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. First things first, we want to thank you for making Locked On Royals your first listen every day and you can check us out on all those podcasting platforms like apple Podcasts, spotify amazon music and you can also catch us on youtube just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe and you can always find me on twitter at johnny j underscore 15 that's at j-o-h-n-y-j underscore one five we do have a reminder that today's show is brought to you by game time if you have Any problems with getting tickets, if you're stressed about getting tickets at the last minute, you do want to use this app to pick up those tickets. It's the only app I use now when I'm buying tickets, whether that be a Royals game, that could be to a comedy show, that could be to a concert. It's so easy to use, so always be sure to find game time and buy your tickets, even if it has to be at the last minute. What I wanted to do to open up the podcast today is really make sure I hit on the two big trades. Now, the Royals have made a flurry of moves over the last 24 hours or so. They traded Jose Quas for Nelson Velasquez of the Chicago Cubs. That was yesterday around 6 p.m.-ish. And I thought at the time uh, that was a move that really caught me off guard. You know, I didn't think Jose Quas would generate much in return, but Nelson Velasquez is a 24-year-old who had, you know, some experience at the big league level. Uh, He had shown some serious pop, about 60-grade power. Uh, He had an incredible go-ahead grand slam all the way back in April. But the Cubs were kind of blocking him at the outfield spots. He's not a great defender, but he does have some of that power that the Royals really liked. And clearly the Cubs like Jose Quas and his arm slot, kind of being a three-quarter slash submarine pitcher, more sidearm if anything. But the whip was high. Uh, Dealing with inherited runners, he wasn't very good either. So I thought for the Royals – this really felt like one of those moves where you didn't really give up much, and I think you have a guy with a decent amount of upside. Then this morning, the Royals go out and get a left-handed pitcher in Tucker Davidson, and to me, it really felt like that was one of those moves where I've been waiting for it about the last three to four weeks, right? Because he's somebody out there that feels like on the waiver wire, he's got a decent slider, decent curve, and The Royals felt like there was a spot in their bullpen that they could go out and give him one of those spots. But to me, it really felt like those were one of those under underlying moves, if you will. One of those moves where you go, oh, you need bullpen depth. I'm kind of tired of giving the same guys the same innings every single time out. Let's see if we can work with this guy a little bit. He's got one good pitch. See what you got in it. And then all afternoon at the trade deadline, the Royals are dead silent. And you feel like, well, there's there's rumors and rumblings of Scott Barlow being moved, Ryan Yarbrough being moved, Carlos Hernandez, Edward Olivares. You think a guy like Matt Duffy could be moved, maybe Taylor Clark. So I'm gearing myself up to really dive into, hopefully, five to six trades that could be made, or maybe three big trades or four big trades. And the minutes start ticking away. And 2 o'clock turns into 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock turns into 5 o'clock. And when 5 o'clock hits, the Royals had not made a move. Now, about an hour and 30 minutes before that, I had tweeted out that J.J. Piccolo had the next 90 minutes to prove me wrong. J.J. Piccolo had 90 minutes to tell me why he was different than Dayton Moore. Because there was a non-zero chance that the Royals wouldn't move anybody. They would use the excuse of, well, he's got club control. We're not just going to trade a guy to trade a guy. But the Royals are also in a spot this year, 43 games under 500, where you need to get some form of a return. And J.J. had said that we're going to get guys that are major league ready and guys that are you know low A and high A guys or 18 and 19-year-old lottery ticket guys in the DSL. 
that seemed to be like the plan. And now as I sit here recording this podcast, it's exactly what he went out there and did. But those trades didn't really trickle in until about 15 or 20 minutes past the deadline. Now it is probably, you know, a likely scenario that this trade or these trades were made before the deadline, but it doesn't get out to the media until about 15 to 20 minutes after that. So I jumped the gun, right? I'm sitting there, hands buried in my face and or, or face buried in my hands. You know what I'm trying to say. I just can't really figure out why the Royals would have not been as active, not been trying to jump over any offer they were given. Because Ryan Yarbrough is not going to be on this team next year. Scott Barlow is not going to be on this team next year. At least shouldn't be. I know he had an extra year of control, but why are you not acting on that? Right, The reliever market seemed pretty high, seemed pretty hot, and I thought it was the perfect time to act on it. But the Royals do get two moves done at the buzzer. They get Ryan Yarborough and package him and send him over to the L.A. Dodgers who need a lot of rotational help, a lot of bullpen help, and they got back two guys in return that I can't really complain with. So it started off with the Yarborough trade. They go and get Devin Mann, who's a 26-year-old first baseman, but has incredible numbers right now in AAA. It would not shock me in the slightest if he joins the team by the end of the week. Like He just doesn't need to be down in AAA any longer. Of course, he was blocked in L.A. Uh, you have Freddie Freeman there. Why is he going to get out there? How is he going to get up there? Now, the good thing is he's a bit of a super utility guy, so maybe that does question why he didn't get up to L.A. Well, we know how loaded and how talented that Dodgers team is, but Devin Mann is a guy that has ridiculous numbers, walk rate of about 13%, uh, WRC plus 125, so that's well above league average, and he can move around. He's played all the infield spots. He's played a corner outfield spot, so I don't really feel like he's going to have much trouble getting up on this roster, right? You can bring him up, play him at first base. Right now, the Royals are playing a mixture of you know, Salvador Perez at first base. They had Nicky Lopez at first base on Sunday, I believe it was. Matt Duffy playing first base. Now you have a guy that does play first base and can play it pretty well. So they get Devin Mann, a 26-year-old AAA guy with good offensive numbers, great plate discipline, more of a mature and advanced approach. Maybe the only knock is that he's 26, right? He's not super young. He's not 22 or 23. But you feel like, hey, this week you can put him in that lineup and see where he goes from there. Then they really get the guy that maybe I'm the most excited about of anybody they acquired today, and that is Derlin Figueroa who had a 372 OBP uh, in the Dominican Summer League. And he had been playing in, in the Arizona Fall League as well, that Arizona League. And uh, the Royals, I believe, just assigned him to surprise. So he's going to get some work down there. But uh, I really like the swing. There's a video out there kind of circulating around on Twitter. I retweeted it, so you can check it out on my, on my Twitter handle, at J underscore 15. It's a really smooth left-handed swing. And these are the lottery ticket guys. He's only 19, year, 19 years old. He's a lottery ticket guys that I really like. This is what you needed to be acquiring because you're not close to contention, right? You want to maybe package, you know, a starter, a reliever, and get maybe somebody who's you know somewhat close to the big league level, but then a lottery ticket guy. You keep loading up on the lottery ticket guy. Somebody's going to hit. That's what you're gambling with. And I really feel like with Figueroa, he is somebody that intrigues me enough. I think he's got really good power, really smooth swing, uh, and the walk-off home run that he had in the video that I retweeted, I mean, that is about as violent but smooth of a swing as you can get from an 18-, 19-year-old left-handed hitter. So that was the return for Ryan Yarbrough. And I tip my cap for what Ryan Yarbrough did. I said this on the podcast before. I'm going to say it again, that he's somebody that really changed my perception over the course of three to four months. When Ryan Yarbrough was struggling in April and May, I was kind of on the train of saying, okay, I've seen enough. You made a one-year deal. You can DFA him. I'd like to see somebody else out there and not somebody that's throwing 85-mile-an-hour fastballs and 67 looping curveballs. You know, it doesn't make too much sense to me because he's clearly not a long reliever. He's not a short-inning reliever. He's not very good for the rotation. Then he gets hit in the face by a 106-mile-an-hour line drive, gets back up. Two months later, he's out there in the bump for Kansas City and was the team's best pitcher for about seven starts. And this is the return you get. I would have called you crazy if I would have said a top 30 prospect would be included in a return for Ryan Yarbrough. He pitched his way into becoming a trade chip. And that's very important for where this team is at. 
So they get Devin Mann, who was a top 30 prospect for the Dodgers, 26 years old, but is hit at every single level. Just really blocked in L.A. with how loaded they are. I'd imagine he joins this team in Kansas City by the end of the week. He's already on the 40-man roster. Then Derlin Figueroa, a 19-year-old kid that you're kind of using as a lottery ticket here. He hits. Man, you're going to look back in two to three years and and really be glad that Ryan Yarbrough, Ryan Yarbrough gave you what he did. But to me, it feels like this is a, a B to B plus type deal for Kansas City. You need to trade Ryan Yarbrough. You did. I think you've got a good investment for somebody that's ready to go right now in Kansas City and somebody that could be ready to go in maybe two to three years. So Ryan Yarbrough goes to the Dodgers and the Royals get two prospects in return. And also this morning, they claim Tucker Davidson off waivers or, or more so made a trade because he was DFA. They send cash considerations to the Los Angeles Angels. And yesterday, they traded Jose Quas, Chicago Cubs, for Nelson Velasquez, who I also think is going to be in Kansas City sooner rather than later. All right, when we come back here, we got to talk about the other trade that happened at the buzzer, and that was Scott Barlow finally being dealt by Kansas City, and they get a top 10 prospect in the Padres system in return and another and another lottery ticket. So I'm going to talk about that next, coming up on Locked on Royals. Before we go any further, we do want to give a shout-out to today's title sponsor in game time. If you're ever struggling to get tickets, you never have to worry with game time. It's so simple. You have no sweat. It is probably the simplest app you can use in buying tickets at the last minute. You're going by yourself. You're going with friends. This is the app you need to go with. That can be the baseball games. Whether it be a Royals game. It could be a concert. It could be a comedy show for all I care. Uh, this is just the app that you need to use in game time. So I'm going to tell you what to do. After this podcast, go download the game time app and create an account and use Locked On MLB for $20 off on your first purchase. Now the terms apply. And again, create that account and redeem code Locked On MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets at the lowest price, guaranteed. So Scott Barlow was the other guy dealt in this uh, buzzer beating trade deadline for the Kansas City Royals. Now Scott Barlow was somebody that was really the centerpiece. After Chapman was traded, you looked at Scott Barlow and you said, he is our guy. He is our guy that we are going to try to pitch to everybody else. He's available, an extra year of control. And you feel like with that on the table, despite his struggles, right? We we discussed his struggles and how at least I didn't believe that was going to drastically affect what his return would be, right? If you like Scott Barlow, you like his stuff, you're going to offer pretty much the same thing that you would have offered a month or two ago because relievers are going to go out there and give up runs, right? Relievers are going to have bad nights. They're going to have off nights. They're not going to have the highest velocity. Their slider, their curve's not going to have the bite to it. I mean, their changeup can't be located. They're going to have off nights. So the Padres, to me, probably like Scott Barlow two months ago, saw this downward trend and still said, well, let's get him into our system. Let's put him in a different spot, not the closer role, and see if he thrives in it. Right right now, he's the ninth inning guy for Kansas City, a team that's rarely in, in save situations. So maybe we feel like we can fix him. So the Padres, to me, were going to give up exactly this return back in June, back in July early July, that is, because the guys they gave up today, it really feels like to me that was always going to be the return, regardless if Scott Barlow was on fire or Scott Barlow was struggling like he has been for the last three to four weeks. So the return the Royals got for Barlow was Henry Williams, who was a top 10 prospect in the Padres system, and another lottery guy in Jesus Rios, who the Padres signed last year out of Mexico. Now, he struggled early on in his first year of professional ball, but just 21 years old. So like the Yarborough trade, you get a guy who is more of the prize, the centerpiece. You know, Devin Mann was the one, the Ryan Yarborough deal. I liked Figueroa more because I think there's more upside, but at least right now with the top 30 name, the top 10 name, you know, Devin Mann was kind of that centerpiece of the deal. Then you get a lottery ticket, throw it. Then when you look at the Padres, Henry Williams, a third round pick as early as last year out of Duke. He was recovering from Tommy John surgery last year. So the numbers aren't great, but he's somebody that really is the highest rated prospect of what you've got today. So for Scott Barlow, who was experiencing a down year, a sluggish year, if you will, they get a top 10 prospect in somebody's system in return. And a guy that still is just 21 years old, 
pitching in low A. I like that a lot. I feel like it's a pretty good return. And if it was one for one, I think I would have been okay with it. I really would have because you get another young pitcher to add to that core down in low A Columbia, high A quad cities. How can I complain about that? And then you get a guy like Jesus Rios, again, more of a throw in lottery ticket guy. He's 21 years old in Dominican Summer League. He came over from Mexico, so a little bit older, not the 16, 17-year-old kids that go play in the DSL. And he has struggled a little bit. But it's something you can work with, right? you got two prospects for Scott Barlow, who's statistically having his worst season of his big league career. I like it. I really do. In the last 24 hours or so, the Royals kind of got a mixture of guys that could be ready this year, next year, and guys that won't be ready for three to four years. But you're continuing to try to load up your system with talent that you can work with. None of these guys are can't miss guys, right? There's no Bobby Witt Juniors in this deal. There's no top 100 guys. This is more so relying on your player development team, which has not been great, but maybe these are guys you have really focused in on. I mean, I, I think for the hitters involved here and the Dodgers trade, but Devin Mann and Figueroa, they both are similar in their approach. They have the high walk rate. They've got a little bit of the pop. They've got a little bit of the power. That's against the grain from what the Royals had typically gone after. In the Dayton Moore era, it was a lot about defense and speed. Contact, speed, not really worrying about walk rate, not really worrying about power, exit velocity. I think this group, this front office, that has been something, though it hasn't pumped out a lot of talent, that is something they've really focused on. They're trying to develop and adapt to the new age of baseball. So when they're looking for prospects, they're not looking for just batting average. They're not looking for speed, how many stolen bases. They're looking for guys that have high walk rates, right? Some of the more the advanced numbers, the ISO, batting average balls in play, OPS plus, you know, WRC plus, all those numbers. They're looking at that a little bit more. And that's why I like the return for Yarbrough. Yarbrough's not a part of the future. You get two guys that could be. Then in the Padres trade with Scott Barlow, you have Carlos Hernandez, who was available to teams, but the Royals hang on to him. He'll now be the closer for the rest of the season. Maybe you move him in the winter along with Salvador Perez, who was willing to waive his 10-5 rights to go to Miami, maybe even San Diego as well. But the Royals do send Scott Barlow to San Diego, and the guys they get in return, I mean, a top 10 guy, still really young. You know, I don't really think the strikeout numbers are as high as they should be, but I think he's got a plus curveball, plus fastball. Henry Williams, that is the top 10 prospect in return. Good fastball, good slider, good curve. It's something to work with. With Rios, there's not enough yet to tell what I could really like about him. I mean, he's only thrown, I believe, 13 big league innings. I think it's between 13 and 18, or not big league innings, professional innings. So there's not much to go off of just yet. And then with Henry Williams, he's recovering from Tommy John. So he struggled a little bit this year, but he's still building his arm back up. And when you're building your arm back up, you're going to go through those growing pains. You're going to go through those struggles. But for what Scott Barlow was worth, this feels like a decent return. I really can't complain about it. This, to me, feels like a pretty damn good return for what you were offering up. Now, could they have done more, right? This kind of feels like the bare minimum, which is why I give them about a B at the deadline. They need to trade these players. Matt Duffy, Taylor Clark, Nick Whitgren, none of those guys were going to generate anything worthwhile. They were not going to go out there and get a prospect that was worth developing because there's no way anybody was offering anything for those players. The guys that had upside, Scott Barlow and Ryan Yarbrough, you traded them. If you wanted to be risky and you wanted to get a bigger return, well, maybe you could have traded Brady Singer, right? There was rumors and rumblings out there that Brady Singer – was generating a lot of interest. But the Royals were asking for the moon. Salvador Perez was generating interest from the Miami Marlins, from the San Diego Padres, and the Chicago White Sox, where he's got that connection with Pedro Grifol. But the Royals decided to hang on to him. You could have traded Hernandez, which I'm sure he had a lot of you know, buzz, had a lot of interest. But the Royals just kind of played it safe here. Now, this does signal something to me. If the Royals would have traded Hernandez, Perez, uh, they would have traded Singer, they would have traded Olivares, who was also rumored to have some buzz, that to me would have signaled, all right, this is a complete teardown. We are getting young prospects in return, which isn't a bad thing, right? I've even advocated for that before. 
but it's a, it's signaling to me that the Royals feel like they're still not in contention yet, but they're not incredibly far off. Or at least, at least, it means John Sherman's willing to spend a little bit more. Because if he's not willing to spend, there's no sense on hanging on to Salvador Perez or Carlos Hernandez or Brady Singer. If you put your window five years from now, you trade all those guys without hesitation. But to me, hanging on to those guys insinuates a little bit that there is going to be some money put in this team in the offseason. How much? I can't really give a definitive answer. But if you were saying this is a teardown, a complete rebuild, I think you get rid of all those guys. You trade all of those guys. What they did is traded the guys they needed to. Hopefully, they'll DFA some guys that no longer deserve to have big league innings. They brought up Jackson Coar and James MacArthur. Again, I'm not too high on them, but if it means that you're just replacing them for now with Ryan Yarbrough and Scott Barlow, I'm not going to complain. But I would like to see Cole Reagans back up. I would like to see Max Castillo back up. I'd like to see Jonathan Bolin and Anthony Veneziano get some chances who are pitching somewhat well in AAA Omaha. Like That's what I want to see. But if you're going to hang on to Carlos Hernandez, a closer on a bad team, Salvador Perez, a 33-year-old catcher on a bad team, Brady Singer, a 26-year-old starter on a bad team, then you got to show that you can build around these guys. You can't just hang on to them and say you're still in a rebuild because you're not. That's not a true rebuild. That's a soft rebuild. And you're not getting enough talent in return. Or you can flip it here. You hang on to those guys, and then the winter meetings, you can flip Carlos Hernandez and Salvador Perez and Brady Singer. But again, more of a wait and see there. The big news of today, they have two deals go through at the buzzer. They trade Ryan Yarbrough to the L.A. Dodgers, and they trade Scott Barlow to the San Diego Padres. They both net a top 30 prospect in return. Henry Williams, a top 10 prospect from the Padres. They get him in that deal with Barlow, along with Jesus Ruiz. They get Devin Mann, a 26-year-old first baseman from the Dodgers, who was the number 28 prospect in their system. And they also get uh, Figueroa, who was a 19-year-old kid in the Dominican Summer League who's got some big-time power. So the four guys they got back in return, can't really complain much about that. All right, before we're all done, I want to dive into a little bit more of this roster construction for the Kansas City Royals. Who could be coming up soon? Who's going to be DFA'd? No more trades can happen. So now it's more so about DFA'ing guys, calling them up, or outright releasing them. That's coming up next on Locked On Royals. You are tuning to Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. Before we wrap up our show today, I want to dive into some roster moves I think that could be coming here in the next couple weeks or so. So you've just traded away guys that needed to be traded. And Ryan Yarbrough and Scott Barlow. You're hanging on to Carlos Hernandez, so that means he's going to be your closer. You traded away Ryan Yarbrough, who was in your starting rotation. So now what does that mean moving forward? I don't believe Ryan Yarbrough is due to start until I believe it might have been this weekend because it's Zach Greinke tonight, of course, and then tomorrow, I believe it would be Brady Singer. Need to pull this up here and go on the fly here. So you get Granky tonight against the Mets. Then it's Alec Marsh, excuse me. Then on Thursday, it's Brady Singer. So on Friday, when the Royals are in Philly, they'll be taking on Aaron Nola, the reigning NL champs there. That is a spot that's to be determined. Could it be a Cole Reagans? That, to me, feels like the most likely option. He's been down in Omaha for quite some time. You just called up on Hel Serpa, who could make that start there, though it kind of feels like he's in a bullpen role right now. Um, Tucker Davidson is going to be added to this roster. He's in Kansas City for now, but hasn't been completely activated. You've got Jackson Coar. You have James MacArthur. I feel like Reagans is going to join this roster and make a start over the weekend. I feel like Velasquez and Devin Mann could be joining the team within the next week or two. I, I much more think that Devin Mann is going to have a spot on this roster by the end of the week because the Royals have a lack of depth at first base right now. And I don't think the Royals want to hang on to Matt Duffy much longer when they've got somebody that has proven he doesn't need to be in AAA anymore, you know, waiting for that spot. Nick Prado's still on the IL. Salvador Perez is playing first base tonight. Uh, this feels like a no-brainer. Now with Velasquez, you didn't trade Edward Olivares. You have Drew Waters. You have Kyle Lisboa. You have MJ Melendez. Where do those at-bats come in? 
You know, I, I feel like it could be a bit longer till Velasquez comes up. But again, he's got major league experience. It's not like you're bringing him up and he's going to be overmatched or overwhelmed. I think Samad Taylor right now is the 26-man roster. You can make a swap there. But the two guys they acquired in the last 24 hours, at least Devin Mann and, and Velasquez, Nelson Velasquez, that is, it, it really feels like those are no-brainers. You have to add them to the 26-man roster. Both are on the 40-man roster right now, so it's an easy flip right there. But I'd imagine we'd see Cole Reagans relatively soon. Uh, some guys are clamoring for Tyler Gentry and Nick Lofton. They have to be added to the 40-man, which means that more DFAs have to happen. Removing those guys from the 40-man roster, I know Nick Whitgren makes a lot of sense. Taylor Clark makes a lot of sense. Matt Duffy makes a lot of sense. Across the board, there, there are guys you can move around, but it's going to start with just the 40-man roster guys, right? Cole Reagans is on the 40-man roster. Velasquez on the 40-man roster. You have Devin Mann going to be on the 40-man roster. So those, to me, feel like the no-brainers of what's going to happen. I think if it was my pick, right, of how I would construct the rotation, I'd like to see Singer and Marsh stay there. I'd like to see Reagans in there. If you're not going to move Zach Grinke and Jordan Lyles, I guess you can plug them in there. But at least three of those guys I want to see. Young guys, Singer, Marsh, Reagans. And maybe you can have a spot start or two from, from Angel Serpa. Maybe Max Castillo could be that guy as a sixth man in the rotation. But to me, it needs to start being that youth movement. Don't need to see guys that aren't going to be a part of this future. And today, I think they added some guys, some fresh faces, some fresh voices that can really make this team better in a more positive light down the stretch of these final two months of the season. Okay, that is going to do it for another edition of Locked On Royals on the Locked On Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. But until next time, you take it easy, Kansas City.